Hello everyone. In a previous video, uh, the one on selective service that I uh, just recently posted, uh, and that'll be in the description box if you want to hear it yourself, if you haven't yet, I hypothesized that it was not the anatomical differences between men and women that are responsible for the reluctance to draft women or include them in the selective service mandate, but it is instead the gynocentrism inherent to our civilization and to human nature that was the culprit. And in this video, I posit a reality in the not too distant future where the further mechanization of warfare would eventually close the gap in strength between men and women completely. And I speculated that even then, even then, uh, women would still be shielded from the responsibility of defending their country, even though they would be at that point equally capable. I referred specifically to exoskeleton technology that will greatly increase human strength on the battlefield, and I mentioned that these exoskeletons are already a reality, and so in this video, uh, before I get to the major topic, I want to provide to you the evidence for that claim, and I'll do so by linking to a video on one of my favorite YouTube channels. Uh, that's the Vice Analog Motherboard, and that'll be in the description box if you want to subscribe yourself. Which uploaded a video on a robotic exoskeleton being developed by Tsukuba University in Japan by robotics professor Yoshiyuki Sankai, who is in conjunction with a company called Cyberdyne working on what he calls the Hybrid Assisted Limb Robotic Exoskeleton. And you see, what's special about this exoskeleton is that it's truly a cybernetic creation, meaning that it not only functions as a machine governed by traditional computer programming, ones and zeros and the like, but it's actually governed as well, in part, by the stimulus your body unconsciously generates. So we're talking about the electrical signals generated from the brain, and so on and so forth. Uh, meaning, and this is an example he gave in the video, that if a person is disabled for whatever reason, this exoskeleton can take the electrical signals of the brain that for whatever reason aren't reaching the target limb or finger or whatever, and actually make it move for the person as opposed to merely assisting the movement of a person in full control of his or her limbs by adding extra force to the direction of the movement. So, you know, watch that video in its entirety if you wish. It's pretty interesting by itself, but I think the more interesting aspect of this technology is going to be how it manifests itself in human society in the future. Uh, so let's talk a bit more specifically about warfare and gender here and, and how it relates to this technology or this upcoming technology. Uh, now, several futurologists have speculated that in the future, uh, warfare is going to be completely roboticized and that the world's conflicts are going to be fought not by humans, but by machines, eventually. And uh, this is debatable, in my opinion. Humans don't stop fighting generally just because they're outgunned, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, warfare of any kind depletes resources, it creates international instability, and it does this especially if an opponent is outgunned, but that opponent still finds a way to force the dominant party to fight it, and if this opponent achieves this, it can then reap the benefits of victimhood capital, and we all know, uh, in terms of our dealings with feminists, just how powerful the appearance of victimhood uh, can be. Right, and we see this uh, currently with the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, and I'm not and I'm not weighing in on either side of this conflict, but the Palestinians currently are outgunned, and you know they still haven't stopped fighting, and in, and in fact, you know a lot of international outrage is being uh, directed at uh, Israelis' use of force against uh, mostly unarmed pal Palestinians. But again, that's a whole other video, and I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the purpose of this video is not to foster Israeli-Palestinian uh, debate. But what we have to understand is that a very large part of warfare is psychological warfare. And it can be argued that physical war only ever happens after a period of intense psychological warfare fails to deliver a victor in the conflict. And if you add to this that soldiers are essentially blood for the machine, they're treated as tools and pawns and weapons to be extinguished on the battlefield. If it can be argued that free will, to whatever degree we have it, is the measure of sentient human beings then robotic warfare has been being waged already for thousands of years. You know, look at boot camp for the United States military and pretty much any modern Western military, and this goes back to the Roman military as well, where all of the external manifestations of a soldier's unique personality are stripped away from that soldier with the sole purpose of psychological assimilation and integration into a collective military identity. His head is shaved, his piercings are removed, he's issued a dog tag with a number, he's forced to walk in cadence, repeating the same words over and over while he marches in unison with his fellow soldiers, 
And these are all, you know, uh, relatively young where their identity isn't completely formed yet, right? Who at 18 years old really has developed his core identity that's going to carry him into old age and eventually to death? So militaries are, you know, undeniably a form of a social organism that is bigger than its component parts, which are, of course, its soldiers, which can also be viewed as the non-biological alternative to a social organism, a machine. And that's why we think of phrases like Nazi Germany's war machine or America's military industrial complex. That's why soldiers are called cannon fodder. They exist as food for a social organism in the same exact way gasoline exists as fuel for the function of a machine. Soldiers are already robots, just inefficient ones. So in the event that warfare is roboticized and one country and another country go to war in which both nations deploy their robotic resources against each other, what happens when one side wins but in the process has its forces decimated by the opposing side? Well, the opposing side will draw on its human fodder in hopes of finishing off the rest of the robotic fleet. And so my point is that human beings, at the very least, have a very long future ahead of them in which humanity will be working in conjunction with machines in warfare as opposed to letting robots engage their enemies exclusively. The human element will not be removed from warfare for hundreds of years into the future as a result of this, and as such, the gender demographics of the people deployed to war in the future can be speculated on. And there are works of fiction that are doing exactly that. Uh, take the trailer uh, for the movie Edge of Tomorrow, uh, starring Tom Cruise, in which a massive war is depicted being fought by humans fitted with these exoskeletons. And it's no easy task, of course, to envision a full-scale mechanized war of the future. You know, it takes creativity, it takes attention to detail and a fair bit of intelligence to portray it and make it believable. But the powers of imaginative speculation that brought this vision to the silver screen still failed, it seems, uh, to imagine a universe where male and female soldiers having the same physical capabilities are equally disposable, as evidenced by the majority of soldiers on the battlefield in the trailer linked below being men. And, and in fact, majority is the wrong word to use. I've looked, I've looked through the entire trailer, and I've counted exactly one female soldier. One! In a massive military operation that would make Normandy look small by comparison, in a fictional reality that has closed the difference in strength between the genders, which, again, I remind you, will be our actual reality in short order. So I've counted one female soldier exactly. And this female soldier, uh, oddly enough, well, not oddly enough, I think, is used to portray the iconic symbol of the war effort. Uh, her, her image is emblazoned and displayed on, on this giant billboard reminiscent of American World War II propaganda posters, you know, to victory and all that. And I can't help but think about when I see this, the fetishization of the Lady Liberty archetype our species holds so dear. And I've talked about this before, where for some reason, men see fit to romanticize warfare with a valiant and unscathed female leading the charge, literally sometimes over dead soldiers. And perhaps this sheds a bit of light on the crushing loneliness that must really boil up to the surface in the subconscious of a man going to war, right? Leading an existence where he straddles the edge of life and death at every moment, being under pressure of attack constantly, or at least the threat of attack constantly. And in these situations, which I can only speculate upon because, of course, I've never been to war, but I speculate that this subject that me and Stardust have talked about, this crushing aloneness that men seem to intrinsically feel and are always experiencing, this crushing aloneness that women are generally shielded from on a societal level by other women and, and supplicating males, this aloneness that the male identity confronts is probably the most potent and foremost in his mind during moments where he's unsure of his next day in an environment like warfare where he could die at any time. And it's probably why he hearkens back to the female, to the mother, to suppress it. Uh, I've quoted Saving Private Ryan numerous times, and I remember a scene which uh, will be in the description box where uh, Tom Hanks' character stops his troop during a mission uh, they're on to, of course, locate this Private Ryan. And he gives this long, dramatic speech about not even caring about saving Private Ryan himself, but that in doing so, uh, in doing so, in saving Private Ryan, if it earns him the right, the right, he said, to get back home to his wife, then that's his mission, and that's what he's going to do. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to watch that scene and really think about that for a second. Dwell on that. Anyway, gentlemen, uh, more videos to come, and that's it for now. Thanks for listening.